Chief Medical Officer for T2 Biosystems and Professor Emeritus at the University of Iowa College of Medicine and College of Public Health. My talk is on candidemia, the role of antimicrobial stewardship and rapid diagnosis. This is an area that I think is a very underappreciated uh, area where we very much need rapid diagnostics so we can improve our care of patients both getting the right drug to the right patient at the right time and eliminating the vast majority of overutilization of antifungal treatment. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Fallon. Uh, Dr. Fallon obtained his medical degree at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. He completed a surgery internship at the Jewish Hospital of St. Louis prior to a residency and chief residency in laboratory medicine at Barnes Hospital of Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Fallon has had a distinguished career and is currently Professor Emeritus of Pathology and Epidemiology at the University of Iowa. Dr. Fowler is an accomplished physician, educator, and researcher in the areas of antifungal agents and resistance, epidemiology of bacterial fungal infections, and the role of the clinical microbiology laboratory in hospital infection control. He has authored or co-authored 685 articles in 72 different peer-reviewed journals, and is one of the authors and editors of the textbook Medical Microbiology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fowler as he gives his talk on candidemia, antifungal stewardship, and the importance of rapid diagnosis. Well, thank you, and thanks for all of you coming and giving me the opportunity to address you, talking about one of my favorite topics that I've worked on for the last uh, three decades or so. Um, let's see. So I have to say, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of T2 Biosystems, but I'm also going to present a, a lot of uh, research work that's been supported by uh, several different pharmaceutical companies, as, as that's been the focus of my uh, investigations throughout my career is in antifungal resistance and the epidemiology of fungal infections. So these are what we're going to cover today. Uh, spend some time talking about the burden of disease, that disease meaning invasive candidiasis, the role of antifungal stewardship in management of candidemia, because as I'll show you, we have a very large number of things to take care of before we get to optimal management of candida bloodstream infections. Important rapid diagnosis and then modifiable factors that can impact mortality. This is what we're always looking for. So what we know about candidate is that it's common. It's second in rank order in North American and European intensive care units. It's the third most common cause of catheter central line associated bloodstream infection uh, in the United States. It's deadly with an attributable mortality of 49%. It's expensive with an average cost of $130,000 per patient. And the management involves time critical decision making. So this is data just showing you over time uh, what we've seen at the University of Iowa We're doing uh, matched cohort studies. So in the 1980s, so this is prior to you know, fluconazole or neoconicamins, we had uh, a crude mortality of 57% and an attributable mortality of 38%. So attributable mortality is that over and above what you see for the underlying disease. Doing the same kind of study design in 97 through 2001, the uh, crude mortality again 61% and the excess mortality 49%. So at least at my institution, we were not doing better with newer drugs. We were doing actually worse. With respect to antifungal stewardship, there's no real magic in terms of antifungal stewardship compared to antimicrobial stewardship in general, and all of those same principles apply. It's just that uh, most of the targets thus far have been uh, antibacterials. And certainly limiting the use of antibacterials is important, actually, in controlling invasive candidiasis because broad-spectrum antimicrobial agents result in candida overgrowth and therefore increase the risk for invasive candidiasis. Candidiasis. But all of these efforts need to optimize the utilization of anti-infective agents, achieve, trying to achieve the best clinical outcome, and minimizing the adverse events and limiting selective pressure. Only after that 
and I realize I'm not talking as an administrator here, but only after that do we worry about reducing excessive costs attributable to suboptimal annual growth micro use. In my opinion, the excess costs that are attributable to that actually are all patient factors that impact on the outcome of the patient and not just the economic impact on the institution. So with respect to trying to be a steward of antifungal agents in the situation where we have uh, invasive candidiasis, there are certainly diagnostic challenges that we'll get into. But importantly, difficult to identify the high risk patients and the subset that's highest risk so you can focus both diagnostic and therapeutic efforts. There's a whole raft of issues with respect to antifungal use, not the least of which is delay in initiating the proper therapy. There's also the wrong drug in case of uh, resistance, and many institutions have uh, Candida vibrata as a prominent portion of their uh, Candida species that they see, and so if you're using fluconazole for a, a empiric therapy, you may be wrong about 30% of the time. Wrong dose is also there. Fluconazole is almost always underdosed. About 80% of the time it is underdosed, and that's because we insist on, in adult medicine, using 400 milligrams per day as a standard treatment for everyone. Well, everyone's not the same. And uh, that dose might be appropriate for someone that weighs 140 pounds, but not someone that weighs 340 pounds. Yet that's what we see time and again. So we are doing our patients a disservice and we're creating a situation that's ideal for resistance. There's also issues with, with wrong, wrong duration and, and that uh, the guidelines try to address, but they're uh, often confusing. Um, antifungal combinations being used for treating candid infections where combinations are essentially never indicated. And then the wrong patient, those that are colonized or those that have, are given, given prophylaxis in situations where prophylaxis has never been shown to be efficacious. So we have to attack these things. These are all correctable, and I'll show you how we can even correct the delay in initiating appropriate therapy. And therefore, maintaining the best standard of care and actually improving our standard of care, uh, despite increasing costs, and taking into account uh, the guidelines that we have from the IDSA and other standards. So this is a, a, uh, an impressive list of personnel for a committee and these are all physicians that are going to be named on a different committee, but we all know that infectious diseases, uh, pharmacy, and microbiology are usually the ones that do the heavy lifting for the stewardship programs, but we certainly like to have the input uh, not only of our surgical colleagues and hospitalists, et cetera, but also even the hospital administration. So each place that Barks on stewardship efforts and the president's uh, now national uh, program to decrease antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial stewardship is going to be in place in virtually every institution in this country within the next five years. We need to adapt those IDSA guidelines to our particular care situation at our institution, take into account the patient populations that we see and the risk factors, as well as local cost considerations. And at the same time, we have to understand the local epidemiology to do that. And that's the easy part. Knowing what our outcomes are in terms of treating any infectious disease, I think, in, in a hospitalized patient population is very difficult to, to get your hands around unless that's an active part of your research efforts as our resources. So the risk for candidemia in patients in the hospital is a continuum. If you look at all patients admitted to the hospital, there are some that are by virtue of either procedures being done to them, their underlying diseases, et cetera, or their age or lack thereof, they're, they're high risk for any infectious complication during their hospitalization. And so everyone needs to be aware of that with these patients. But in addition, there are exposures that some of these patients will have that put them at even greater risk for candidemia and invasive candidiasis. And these are independent risk factors from 
two different match cohort studies that we've uh, conducted at the University of Iowa. So these are uh, all independent by multivariate analysis. Odds and ratios are shown here in parentheses. And you can see that these exposures are not uncommon in an ICU situation. But for that reason, you have to realize that invasive candidiasis or candidemia in that situation is very, very important. So prolonged ICU states, central venous catheters, dialysis, antibiotics, TBM colonization are the key factors that we've come up with. If candidemia develops, 40% will die. Of those that survive, they'll be in the hospital on average 30 days longer than they would have been had they not gotten infected during their hospitalization. And this chart graph shows you how you can utilize some of these uh, risk factors to further uh, risk stratify a patient population. This is a, a paper published by Dick Wentz and colleagues back a few years ago where they calculated the risk of infection based on the baseline risks in an ICU of 1%, 2.5%, or 5%. And each ICU can generate that data quite readily. So if you have a patient in that setting where they're on four different antibiotics and the odds ratio is 1.74 for each antibiotic class, so you have an increase to uh, 7 fold. So your 1% risk went to 7, this went to 15, and this went to 35. And this is actually a patient population group where at one extreme you might consider early empiric therapy or stratifying to further by a rapid biomarker to uh, look at additional risk. But if you look over here, four antibiotics plus colonization at a mucosal site. Those patients, irrespective of the baseline risk at that institution, are at very, very high risk for invasive candidiasis and certainly should be considered uh, for early therapy. This is a paper that's just in press in Journal of Critical Care. It's from Washington University where they looked at 2,500 patients with severe sepsis or septic shock and positive blood cultures. What they found is that 10% of those were candida and for their independent risk factors for uh, candidemia in that very critically ill population were listed here. So mechanical ventilation, TPNs, central venous catheter, and prior antibiotics, very similar to what we had generated uh, earlier. But in addition, admission from a nursing home and transfer from another institution were important and new risk factors that one should keep in mind, certainly for invasive candidiasis in a patient that's septic, but also for multi-drug resistant bacteria, which we are increasingly seeing as being uh, these being reservoirs. And importantly, the lung as a source of infection was actually a negative predictor, which goes to stands the reason we know that candida pneumonia is extremely rare, if ever, uh, a clinical entity. And so if a patient comes to you with all of these things in place, but it looks like they have a mnemonic process, then candida probably shouldn't be on the top of your list. And so then they, they uh, derived an integer score from those co coefficients that I've just shown you. And so they give two points for prior antibiotics, and you can see how they go. And they give minus six for lung as a source. And by applying these to their uh, population, they found a prevalence of candidemia of 1.2% for a score of minus six and 42% for a score of eight. And by receiver operating uh, curve characteristics, they came up with uh, a candidemia score of three or greater being predictive of patients with sepsis or septic shock of having candidemia. They increased the rate of candidemia in that population into 18.5%. With a sensitivity of 87%, specificity of 56%, and a low positive predictive value with a high negative predictive value. And I'm showing you this because I'll come back to this data towards the end. So clearly when you look at the whole scheme of treating, identifying and treating patients with candidemia and invasive candidiasis, we know that there are certain patient groups that are at high enough risk 
where prophylaxis is necessary and has been shown to be advantageous, and that's in the stem cell transplant patients. So we do prophylaxis in that even prior to any evidence of disease because it's inevitable that they would get infected with their own flora. Most of the time, though, we're out here. We have five high-risk febrile patients receiving antibiotics, and after 48 hours or so of uh, lack of response, we consider empirical antifungal therapy. And as I'll show you um, later, that's clearly inadequate. That's not a timely way of administering those, and it's locked us in to a 40% mortality in patients with invasive candidiasis or candidemia. So we'd like to be here, high-risk asymptomatic patients, say in an ICU. A positive score, which is what the Wash U group was trying to develop there, or the use of a biomarker, which they use in Europe. They also do Canada scores in Europe where they do surveillance cultures and look at sort of organism load, as well as testing twice a week or three times a week with man-an, anti-man-an uh, uh, tests that can help uh, diagnose invasive candidiasis. So hopefully we can get to here, and hopefully that will actually have a positive impact. So I mentioned know your local epidemiology. Well, species level identification should be uh, part and parcel of a, of a competent microbiology lab, and in most cases it is. Doing a, creating an antifungal susceptibility profile, an antifungogram just like an antibiogram uh, is also important, and I'll mention the details in that in a minute. And you can supplement data, your own data from data from public surveys. There are several that we've conducted uh, uh, based in, out of the University of Iowa, including one statewide program, the EIEIO program, which is the epidemiology of invasive, emerging infections in the epidemiology of Iowa organisms. And then the CDC has done also population-based surveillance work that's uh, very useful as well. So when we consider candida, we know that there are a large number of species of candida, but only a handful that we see regularly causing infections in hospitalized patients. And those are five species. They account for at least 97% of all uh, human infections, certainly since the mid-1990s. And they're candida albicans, candida vibrata, candida proxylosis, tropicalis, and cruzii. The exact distribution is going to vary from institution to institution uh, and even geographic location, certainly by risk group where you have candida labrata and cruzii in patients with stem cell transplants because they get azole prophylaxis and these are azole resistant organisms. Candida prapsulosis is a catheter fungus. It's often contaminating the hubs of catheters and then having a bloodstream infection based on that. We see that in patients on TPN and in neonates especially. Candida vibrata in the elderly, which includes those people older than me and tropicalis in oncology patients. So most labs have a variety of phenotypic tests that are used to identify candida. In many instances, those are still used despite the fact that we know they're slow. They do work for the common species. So in this study where they used, first looked at growth detection of these four species, albicans, vibrata, prapsulosis, and tropicalis, you see that the time to detection in blood cultures ranges from one day to three days or more. And the time to get adequate species specific therapy, which factors in the time to species identification, is even longer. And as, as you'll see, these are far outside of the window that we need for optimal uh, treatment of these infected patients. So because of the slow uh, time to uh, species identification for some of the phenotypic methods, many laboratories are using one or more of these uh, more rapid methods. DNA fish, which is peptide and nucleic acid fluorescent in situ hybridization, done directly from blood cultures, DNA sequencing, or uh, the proteomic approach from Alditoff. These can be applied to blood cultures and agar-based cultures, but they're all post-culture. So that you can get rapid results, but you still have to wait for the culture to become positive. 
why do we really want to identify candidate species? Well, we know that the in vitro patterns of antifungal susceptibility and the associated clinical outcomes vary among the different candidate species. Species identification is a surrogate for antifungal susceptibility testing as recommended by the IDSA guidelines uh, for selecting uh, empirical therapy. And we have species-specific interpretive criteria for clinical breakpoints for those drugs and those species for which we have clinical data. And then we have epidemiological cutoff values or microbiological cutoff values for those organisms and drugs where we have no clinical data. So this is an idealized antifungogram for uh, purposes of looking at these susceptibilities. So we know Canada alcans of tropicalis in, in this country for sure are pan-susceptible to virtually every class of antifungal agents that we have. They may come up to the odd resistant organism, but in general, they can be reliably covered, certainly with fluconazole or with other triazoles like voriconazole. Same thing goes for candida parapsilosis, although it's less susceptible innately to the echinocandins, and I'll show you some reasons why there's concern about parapsilosis and the echinocandins, but in the new IDSA guidelines, I think that that concern is going to be considerably alleviated because the clinical outcomes really show that this class of agents works for that species. It's elevated MICs notwithstanding. Then we have Candida glabrata and Candida cruzii, which uh, are a multi-drug resistant species that we most commonly encounter. Only about two to three percent of Candida bloodstream infections are due to Candida cruzii, but everyone understands that Candida cruzii is resistant to fluconazole. It's resistant innately to fluconazole, um, and uh, that drug should not be used. But the newer echinocandins, voriconazole, posiconazole, and now the most recently approved one, asabuconazole, are all active against candida cruzii despite its resistance to fluconazole. That is not the case with candida glabrata. A candida glabrata that's resistant to fluconazole will be resistant to the other azoles as well, and those should not be used uh, uh, in that situation. So candida glabrata, being the second most common species, is not optimally susceptible to amphotericin B. It's not rapidly killed by that drug. We've already talked about flu uh, uh, fluconazole, and, and we don't call it susceptible to fluconazole, susceptible dose dependently, to emphasize that you need to use a higher dose if you're going to use fluconazole to treat that species. 12 milligrams per kilogram per day is the dose that's been shown to be efficacious in candida vibrata. But most folks are going for a kind of candens, and what I'll show you is that the kind of candens are not bulletproof, and we're seeing resistance emerge in this country in that species. So in our surveillance work, I focus my attention uh, recently on three different species, certainly candida vibrata for the reasons that I mentioned. In the United States, 10 to 25 percent of all isolates are resistant to all azoles. 3 to 10 percent now are resistant to the echinocandins. And so we have azol and echinocandin resistance in a substantial proportion of bloodstream isolates of this species. Clearly the most important. I mentioned candida parapsilosis and elevated MICs and intrinsically decreased susceptibility to echinocandins. And for, for that reason, fluconazole has been uh, touted as first line for parapsilosis. We're seeing about 4% acquired resistance now, and so that's something we're keeping an eye on. And certainly by virtue of changing the catheter and instituting antifungal therapy, that particular species can man be managed quite well. And then I mentioned Canada tropicalis being pan-susceptible in the United States, but that's not the case in the rest of the world. So in Japan, 40% of their isolates of Canada tropicalis are resistant to fluconazole. Uh, we've been able to validate that claim, uh, and so, uh, but I don't understand the difference between there and here. But in Europe, they're seeing increasing resistance as well, 47% compared to 2% in the United States. But in the past year, we've seen in the United States an emergence of kind of candor resistance in that species. 
It's not unprecedented with Canada Tropicalis, but it's distinctly unusual for the United States, and so it's another one that we're uh, following closely. So the Sentry Surveillance Program is one that we've uh, uh, conducted for since the mid-1990s, and it's about 100 institution uh, uh, cohort uh, globally. This is United States data from over a, a multi-year period, so you can see the frequency with which Canada Dubrata is causing bloodstream infection overall has increased, as it has fluconazole resistance, as had a kind of cannon resistance. So we're seeing increasing resistance to both of those classes, as well as an increased presence of that species causing infections. The CDC has done uh, population-based studies in the Atlanta and Baltimore metropolitan area for quite some time now, and they see a steady increase in echinocandin resistance among Canada Glabrata bloodstream isolates as well. But just to show you that you really need to pay attention to your own local experience, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Portland, Oregon, they really see far less, uh, certainly in Portland, they see far less, if any, uh, echinocandin resistance in any species. And in fact, their, species, their uh, resistance rate to fluconazole in that species is only 6%. So there's something that they're doing uh, there that minimizes the evolution of resistance. But this is an important slide, even though it's busy. Um, and it shows examples of what we're seeing in our really high-risk patient populations. So this first study from Duke, uh, it was a 10-year study of Candida glabrata bloodstream infection in their institution. Almost all of them were from their surgical uh, ICU. Uh, our laboratory at GMI uh, supported this with susceptibility testing. And we found that the frequency of mutations that, are, that encode for the resistance to that uh, class of agents, the echinocandins, was about 8%. So 8% echinocandin resistance. And prior echinocandin exposure was a predictor of echinocandin resistance and of the characteristic mutations. And elevated echinocandin MICs and a characteristic FKS mutation correlated with a reduced clinical outcome. Essentially the same thing was seen in, by Nick Bain and colleagues at St. Luke's in Houston. There they had 18% molecularly confirmed resistance in the candida Prior echinocandin exposure was a predictor of that mutation and predictor of treatment failure with an echinocandin. And essentially the same thing was seen down here at the University of Pittsburgh with 8% resistance. Prior echinocandin exposure predicted clinical failure as well as resistance. So the take home message from here is know what your patient's been on. If they've been on azoles and echinocandins, those are probably not the drugs that you want to use for empiric therapy, at least until you know what the species is and possibly the susceptibility. So this just shows you the trajectory of things uh, happening at, at Duke. Over 10 years, they saw their, uh, econ their fluconazole resistance going from about 17% to 30%, and their echinocandin resistance for all three echinocandins increasing to 12 to 14%. So in their top species of candida causing infections in their surgical intensive care unit, they're resistant to fluconazole 30% of the time and the echinocandins 10, 12 to 14% of the time. Not good odds if you're selecting an, an empiric course of therapy to treat those patients with. And then this just underscores some of the concerns surrounding candida parasolosis and the echinocandins. So candida parasolosis was isolated in 53% of candida patients with breakthrough fungemia while on Casper fungin. This is at MD Anderson Cancer Center. At the University of Maryland, they found a strong correlation between Casper fungin use and a 400% increase in candida parasolosis bloodstream infection. <laughs> The CDC's data from 93 to 2011 shows a species-specific incidence of parapsilosis bloodstream infection that's doubled over that time. Pre-exposure to Casper fungin decreased candida albicans in favor of candida parapsilosis in a French ICU. And then this is just 
a small study that showed that you could get improved response if you doubled the dose of castofungin. This was an 80% versus 61% uh, improved response, but the numbers were too small to achieve statistical significance. Nevertheless, this is likely some data that's going to find its way into the new IDSA guidelines as well, supporting the utility of this class of agents in treating parapsilosis. I should mention that if you do see Canada parapsilosis in the bloodstream of a patient, you should take that as a red herring or a red flag, I mean, not a red herring, a red flag for breaks in catheter care and infection control, et cetera. That, that, that's really the, the, what that's the marker of. So in summary for, for resistance, greatest concern is still azole resistant vibrata. We do have to be concerned with the emergence of the kind of candle resistance in that species and possibly tropicalis. Emergence of uh, non albicans species with decreased uh, susceptibility to azoles is also something that we're watching. This is an important finding, again, from the University of Pittsburgh. 30% of candid vibrata isolates from patients with prior exposure to echinocandins. And either candidemia or endobalical candidiasis are echinocandin resistant. So you don't want to get to the situation that they are at the University of Pittsburgh. And these are largely in their liver transplant population. So that's one population that bears uh, close watching wherever you see them. Uh, but I think it's an important finding that shows how this kind of resistance can emerge and can cause problems in a given institution. So what about diagnosing? Well, we have a problem with early diagnosis. We don't have any, any specific clinical signs and symptoms for candidemia or invasive candidiasis. The invasive diagnostic procedures in that already critically ill population are risky. And we have the lack of sensitive and minimally invasive assays. So we're going to talk about some of those, starting with blood culture and then going on to commercially available uh, rapid diagnostic methods, and finally talking about the impact of delayed or inappropriate therapy and how we can address that. So when we think about the entity of invasive candidiasis, there are uh, essentially three uh, pots that you can put these in. So you can have candidemia in the absence of deep-seated candidiasis. That's about 30% of the all cases. So blood culture is positive there. These are almost all catheter-related uh, infections. You have candidemia plus deep-seated candidiasis, an another third of the infections. So blood culture is not always positive here, but other sites may be, and those might be difficult to uh, diagnose, although we still depend on having blood cultures uh, show us the way there. And then you can have deep-seated candidiasis where we don't have positive blood cultures. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but these are almost all intra-abdominal cases. Uh, they're certainly important when you look at patients with intra-abdominal surgery, whether it be liver, pancreas, small bowel transplantation, or simple perforation. Um, we miss these. Blood cultures rarely, if ever, positive here. And so the overall impact is that blood cultures are insensitive in general. So we, I already showed you they're slow, hours, uh, not really hours, days to positivity for Canada. They're insensitive. In this paper by Clancy and Wynn, they looked at 415 cases of autopsy-proven invasive candidiasis, and over 38% had a positive anti-mortem blood culture. Now, this is the kind of data we were used to seeing back in the 80s when uh, we actually did autopsies. Uh, now we bury our mistakes, and so that data is not front and center for all of us. In addition, blood culture systems aren't all, all the same. So the two major blood culture systems used in this country, the BACTEC and the BACT alert agree with one another about 60% of the time in head-to-head -head studies of detection of candidemia. And the main reason for that is that the BACTEC system tends to miss candidate vibrata. It doesn't miss all of them, but it misses about 15 to 20% of them. Uh, and for that reason, uh, a, if that system is in place, a fungal blood culture should probably be done uh, as well. 
We know from our experience with hepatic candidiasis that not only are biopsies problematic in terms of sampling error, but in patients that are on antifungal therapy, we know that the decrease is the sensitivity of culture. By 50% in this particular example, that's also the case for blood cultures. Our resins and our other things that remove anti-infective agents are not optimally uh, uh, efficient for antifungal agents and the prior exposure also decreases their growth rate, so you might miss them then. So we still need blood cultures. Despite the fact that they have poor sensitivity and they're slow, they remain at the heart of invasive candidiasis care guidelines because there are more, are, there are broad safety blanket for catching things that we don't anticipate. But rapid culture independent tests should complement blood culture, particularly giving us time critical information that we use to limit mortality and emergence of resistance. So the beta D glucan test is one test that is used and that's FDA cleared in the United States. It is not specific for Canada. It can also be used to diagnose invasive aspergillosis and pneumocystis to name a few. But this meta-analysis did tease out data for Canada and showed a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 85%. Um, and in the literature, those numbers vary wildly. This is a, a test that is, has a lot of false positives, but has been used for its high predictive value of a negative if you use it in a low prevalence situation. I mentioned Manan anti manin which is a combination test that's used in Europe. Its sensitivity is 83%, specificity 86%. And it's, uh, again, used in high-risk patients, testing them two to three times per week. Um, it's in their uh, Canada guidelines as well. And then there are some commercial PCR tests for Canada that, that will go through. So Quest Diagnostic is a big reference laboratory in, in this country, and they have a real-time PCR for Canada. You use a serum rather than whole blood. Understand that if you, when you clot blood you, and centrifuge that clot down, you also remove a lot of your target. So by the fact that you have to use serum uh, decreases your sensitivity. They also do DNA extraction, which further decreases the sensitivity, but it's necessary because the real-time PCR methods really need a clean specimen and one that does not contain human DNA or hemoglobin or other pigments. They don't have published sensitivity and specificity data in the literature or on their website but they do publish uh, in the, on their website limited detection ranging from 1 to 350 CFU per mil. Again, understanding that about 60% of documented candidemias are less than 10 CFU per mil. Viracor is another reference laboratory outside of Kansas City, and they have a real-time PCR for Canada, uh, the performance of which in the single center is published here. Um, it's not FDA clear, it's a laboratory developed test, so they can offer it and you can pay for it. Uh, it uses plasma serum and DNA extraction and plays a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 70%. Interestingly, with respect to their sensitivity, it was lower for candidemia than it was for deep-seated candidiasis, which is a little bit funny because our the uh, number of organisms in blood in cases of deep-seated candidiasis is generally lower than that for candidemia. And they claim a limited detection of less than one colony forming unit per mil. A platform that's available in Europe but not here is a Roche Septifast uh, platform. It's again a real-time PCR. They have 25 different infectious targets, uh, 19 bacteria, 5 species of Candida and Aspergillus fumigatus. They use whole blood but includes DNA extraction. Um, and of course it's not available in the United States. Uh, it's typical of a conventional uh, PCR test and that has about a six hour turnaround time uh, for, from sample to result. Their published sensitivity is 61% with a specificity of 99%. And their limited detection ranges from 3 or 30 to 100 CFU per mil. Now to put these data into 
perspective, you need to look at the findings of this meta-analysis of PCR for direct detection of candida from blood that was published in uh, 2011. They defined the optimal conditions for diagnosis of candidemia using 54 studies and close to 5,000 patient results. So whole blood was a specimen, but they used DNA extraction from whole blood in every case. Multi-copy target, so that the target is seen in multi, multiple copies throughout the genome of the organism, and a limit of detection of less than 10 CFU per mil. If those were uh, achieved, you had a sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 92%, so we're finally getting somewhere. You mentioned the T2MR test for direct detection of candida in whole blood. MR stands for magnetic resonance, which is a, an important component of this technology. So this clinical trial was published uh, in CID actually just in March. 1,801 subjects using whole blood without DNA extraction. It, it is an FDA cleared test. And in that particular study, the sensitivity and specificity were 91.1 and 99.4% respectively. Turnaround time from sample to result as fast as three hours and a limited detection of one to three CFU per mil. Looking at the positives, median time to blood culture, detection, and species identification was 129 hours versus 4.4 hours. For, for negatives, negative blood culture is usually called within five days, 120 hours. Median time to, for a negative result with the T2 test is uh, 4.2 hours. So this is a novel technology using T2MR. Um, target amplification, nanoparticle capture of the amplicons, and then signal amplification and detection by T2MR. So T2MR takes into account the perturbation of the molecular environment around the water molecules in the specimen and looks for the time to which the hydrogen atoms in that, those water molecules come back to resting state after being pulsed with a magnetic field. So it's a non-optical detection method and it also provides signal amplification in addition to target amplification. Use whole blood without culture extraction or sample manipulation completely automated with less than five minutes of hands-on time and utilizes uh, amplification of the ITS2 region. The, the amplicons hybridize the nanoparticles that then elicit this T2MR signal. So a very different technology than standard PCR methods. So given what I've shown you so far, the question has to be, what are you missing? I've already said we bury our mistakes. So we know blood cultures are insensitive. Limited detection is around 10 CFU per mil. Growth is inhibited by antifungal exposure, and you may miss species such as Candida glabrata with back tech. Actually, Candida glabrata with any system could be missed because of its slow growth, and anything that slows its growth might make the culture look negative at five days. So culture-independent diagnostic tests can, may, might be able to detect invasive candidiasis with negative blood cultures. Why might you have that situation? Candida cleared from blood but not tissue. Concentration in the bloodstream that's less than the limit of detection of blood culture, which I said happens about 60% of the time. Or translocation of the portal system with then seeding of intra-abdominal foci, particularly liver and spleen, without any peripheral fungemia. So there are a number of ways that you can envision as to why we might not detect candida. And so one of the missions that, that I've been on is to try to identify invasive candidiasis and blood culture negative patients using the T2 candida test. So far we have eight patients with positive T2 candida results and negative blood cultures with documented invasive candidiasis. Three of these cases had prior positive blood cultures but then were negative on follow-up, positive by T2. Four cases with negative blood cultures, positive T2 and candid on tissue biopsy or from uh, other sites. One of those cases went from the University of Pittsburgh, 12 consecutive negative blood cultures uh, with a uh, positive T2 test and then a lap laparotomy on day seven showing a pancreatic abscess. And then finally one case with negative blood cultures, positive T2 
positive catheter tip, urine, and mayonnaise and anti mayonnaise tests. So these are hard to come by, although they're not uncommon, they're just hard to find because you need an aggressive surgical team to go in and make those diagnoses usually. Um, we also have data with pediatric candidemia. So we have blood taken from patients where you can get at least three mLs of blood. We uh, look to see whether we could just pipette in two mLs of blood into the system and in fact found that we could reliably detect candida frasilosis, tropicalis, and albicans in those pediatric samples. So we have a non-culture method for the diagnosis of candidemia. Um, what's the role uh, of this? Well, you could certainly entertain serial screening of high-risk patients. That can facilitate earlier diagnosis, targeted preemptive therapy, reduce the use of empirical therapy, and monitor responsive therapy. But it doesn't matter. We can have the best test in the world, do it in a blink, and get the results reported rapidly. But if they're not acted upon by the clinician, they go for not. And certainly it's been clear that rapid diagnostic tests have little impact in the absence of active antimicrobial stewardship or diagnostic testing stewardship, making sure that those results are acted on. So one strategy is to stratify according to risk, and I've given you a couple of ways that one could do that. Do prospective screening by a rapid nucleic acid amplification test combined with other diagnostic tests like blood culture and imaging studies. What we always want to do is try to look at the prevalence of disease in the population that we're treating. And this exercise just compares T2 with the published sensitivity and specificity data of beta D glucan uh, on the right hand side. And you can see at low prevalence, uh, 32 to 5 percent, both of these testing parameters uh, show a very high predictive value of a negative. Um, when you look at the, the improved sensitivity of T2 and specificity, you see a much more uh, uh, higher positive predictive value as well. So our problems with antifungal use that influence outcome development resistance primarily are that we get them too late. There's also poor indications, as I mentioned, prophylaxis in those populations where it's not warranted respiratory and urinary tract colonization that's treated, and all of this leads to overuse and possible resistance selection. Drug pressure, of course, which, which I've shown you, results in resistance. So this is some of the first data uh, looking at time to therapy with candida bloodstream infection. This is from Washington University in St. Louis. So delay in treatment is an independent determinant of hospital mortality. Treatment delayed more than 12 hours, got a 33% mortality versus 11% with no delay. Same kind of findings from a four-center study looking just at fluconazole, days to start fluconazole. Started on, on the day the culture is obtained, your mortality is 15%. You wait three days and your mortality is 45% and up. This is data from Italy where they showed the same thing. Importantly, only 7.5% of their patients had treatment administered within 48 hours of uh, the first entertainment of the diagnosis, and they had the lowest mortality. And you can see as time went on, you had more patients on therapy, the mortality going up uh, substantially. And then here's a study which looked at three different risk factors for mortality. Retained central venous catheter, inadequate fluconazole dose, and treatment delayed more than 48 hours. All three of these sins, and you have essentially 100% mortality, take care of business, and you have mortality lower than 20%. So there's many things that we can do to improve on outcomes. And here's one with specifically patients treated with castrofungin. Treatment within the first 24 hours had a significantly better response than delayed therapy, and time in hospital was shortened by seven days. We've taken much of this information from the literature and worked with a health service research group to develop an e economic mortality model, uh, looking at seeing how T2 Canada as a rapid diagnostic test could impact on both outcomes and costs. So assuming an annual high-risk patient population of 5,000 or so, and 40% of those receiving empiric therapy, and I know that'll 
rate varies from 20% to 100%, depending on where you look. Taking a, a low prevalence of disease, 3% prevalence. The cost per tested patient, this is the overall cost of caring for those patients. Using a blood culture strategy per tested patient, $2,400. Cut that in half with T2 Canada strategy, meaning early treatment and less resources utilized. Deaths per year, likewise, decreased by 31 or 32, a 60% decrease in mortality. So this is an idealized kind of uh, thing that you could anticipate. We have no uh, uh, doubt that, you know, everyone's not going to toe the line. You're not going to get clinicians to stop all the time. You're not going to have every patient treated right in the, uh, on the earliest time point. But should you do that, uh, you actually can really impact on the mortality, which I think is most important. And then we talk about sepsis. Sepsis and invasive candidiasis is not uncommon. In the United States, this study by Kett and all looking at an in intensive care units in the United States found half the cases of invasive candidiasis met the criteria for sepsis. The sepsis guidelines published two years ago now uh, always reiterate timely within one hour appropriate antimicrobial therapy. They now also include antifungal therapy there specifically because each hour of delay increases mortality by 8%. That's true for, for bacterial treatment as well as antifungal treatment. Source control, obviously, both catheter management and drainage of abscess is important. And they indicate use of biomarkers, if available, when invasive candidiasis is considered. Again, taking into account the European experience with the use of main and anti -man -an. So this is a study from WashU. 2,500 consecutive patients with positive blood culture and sepsis or septic shock, 10% of which were candida. Uh, inappropriate therapy was seen in 62% of the patients with candidemia, and the mortality was 47% for candidemia, 28% for bacteremia. These are patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. So, just doing the exercise using this data, uh, so you see the patient with candidemia, patient with bacteremia, using the uh, sensitivity and specificity from the clinical trials of T2 Canada, your positive predictive value in that patient population would be close to 95% with a negative predictive value of 99%. So this is the direction I think we want to go to get on top of this problem. And the benefits of it are shown here. So this is uh, data again from WashU, basically with the same patients in their severe sepsis uh, cohort, 266 patients, those receiving treatment within 24 hours of shock have significantly better outcomes than those not receiving treatment within 24 hours. They also included timely source control in there as well. So by getting treatment on board early, you save lives. So, bottom line, antifungal stewardship and rapid diagnosis of candidemia uh, should improve care, both by increasing awareness of candidiasis, improving diagnosis, and focusing therapy. By doing that, we should be able to save lives, save dollars, and avoid resistance selection pressure. And that concludes what I have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for questions. We got quite a few ID types in the audience. Um, ID doctors can never read anything, so nobody. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that struck me is in thinking about the way we treat patients. You know, we we sort of if, if we have a patient we think has risk factors for invasive candidiasis or septic, and we think they have risk factors for azole resistance, we've been giving them the kind of candidates. But your, your data suggests that that is not always a great strategy, particularly for some species. Of course, the alternative is probably amphotericin, which is, which is not an attractive alternative. So it seems like um, we're between a rock and a hard place, and stewardship is the key to avoid resistance, so we don't have to use these toxic agents. I don't know if anybody, anybody else is struck. I certainly I agree. And the, the issue of kind of cancer resistance just puts a point on knowing what your own experience is. Because not every, because my institution 
seems no one kind of can and resist it. Yeah, yeah. All right. And that's exactly, honestly, I was thinking yeah. with the, seeing the data that is existed to pull both Azores and Econocandin, what to do. Yeah. And then Ambizone or Avisat. Yeah, look at the formulation of Avisat. Then, I, I also agree, yeah. we do uh, the stewardship, we will take it earlier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And most of the residents are, are too young to have a lot of experience in amputation, but, uh, you know, residents with gray hair uh, appreciate how difficult those drugs are to use in any ways. So, um, Dr. Jacobs, what's our, what's our uh, econocandin resistance in UH? We, we see very little resistance. So far, yeah. yeah. I'm actually putting on one of these all day, but it's very rare that we get an econocandin okay. resistance. So, it all depends on the product. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Federico, do you know about the VA? Do you, are you? Yeah, very little as So far. Yeah. So maybe we're doing a good job of stewardship. Uh, <laughs> I will put to keep it up. Um, Dr. Perez. How does the P2 look like in the microlab? What's the, is it a? It's a, it's a box. <laughs> it's a box. It's, it's not a black box. It's a three feet by three feet by two and a half, something like that. Uh, it has seven bins, random access, and you basically can put, test, use a four mil purple top tube, uncap it, put it on the cartridge, put the cartridge in the instrument, and three hours later, bings and tells you if it's positive or negative. That is what it does. Sounds awesome. So it can go in a core lab, it can go in a stat lab, it can go in a micro lab, it can go in a molecular lab. It does not require a molecularly trained or even a microbiologically trained individual. Um, and uh, to me, that was one of the attractions of this, being someone that's worked in the diagnostic, clinical diagnostic field for 30 years, I thought, wow, I haven't seen that simple for a long time. You could. They'll get food in it or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, as soon as you buy an ultrasound machine, we'll go uh, yes. we'll with we'll this. Uh, we're going to see two uh, in the study published in the CID, there were a couple hundred indeterminate results. Yeah. So, so these were the first eight or so instruments developed and placed. The indeterminate rate actually went down over the course of the study, which showed that some of that was, was user error, despite how simple it is. Um, the rest of it we've been able to figure out were problems with the vortexer and the centrifuge that are inside that box. And we've made those corrections, and the goal is to have no more than 2% uh, indeterminate or invalid results, um, and uh, so that's 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 not my job. That's the company's job, but that's what they are dedicated to doing. So, but good pickup. Sure. Um, one last question: yeah. How expensive is it since uh, you know, so it's possible to have more than uh, one machine in one institution? So? Yeah. Well, we're working with a variety of different models, that, that most of which do not require outright capital purchase. But um, it's a, this list price is $265 per test. So that's included in that economic model. That paper is in press this week, uh, available electronically, so you can look at that data if you'd like. But, um, the fact is, if we make earlier diagnoses save lives and decrease length of stay, that all has an economic bearing. Um, uh, yeah, so. Cool. Um, and if there's no further questions, I want to thank you for a really stimulating talk. Thank you. Thank you.